I remember a few months ago when I was jamming on Spotify, when one song came up near the bottom of my playlist. Listening to it, one particular verse caught my attention. Hey, I want it all, don't have to choose. And the heart wants what it wants, what can I do? So I'll take that one, that one, and that one too. Luxury and opulence. That singular verse paints a clear picture of an insufferable phenomenon called materialism. I hate it. Most people do. But what do we really know about the term materialism? What do we really know about capitalism? Let's go more than just textbook definitions. Let's talk economy. Let's talk society. Let's talk uncomfy. Let's talk capitalism. I currently reside in Nigeria, a country I've previously never been to, but I've always heard about. From childhood to now, most of what I'd heard about Nigeria was just about how pretty damn awful its government was. My mom never majored in economics or politics, but she had a lot to say about her native country, most of which wasn't ideal. She ran about the economy, about the politicians, and most specifically, about corruption. Even as a kid, the message I got was crystal clear. Boy, I'm pretty glad I was born in America. <laughs> and in certain ways, my thankfulness was validated. According to Transparency International, Nigeria only scores 24 out of 100 on the corruption index and ranks 154 out of 180 total countries. Pretty measly compared to Denmark's number one position with a score of 88, Canada's 13th position with a score of 74, even the US's 27th position with a score of 67. Compare that to Nigeria and we do more than pale in comparison. We wither. However, certain countries with high scores aren't as big as Spanish as they'd like you to believe. Let's compare Nigeria and the US for emphasis. Both Nigeria and the US have issues involving political corruption and scandals done by those meant to protect the people and their interests, the exploitation of workers, a the persistent use of capital punishment, a low life expectancy, and lastly, the purposeful ignorance of basic rights, including the right to dignity and the right to gen and the description and the right to dignity and the right to an adequate standard of living. The U.S. holds its self-issued title of being the capital of capitalism proudly, but the capitalism that the U.S. practices isn't doing it any favors. The Nigeria has copied the U.S.'s love of the man in the top hat and the black suit, and now the innate poison of the corporate system has seeped into the very way that both countries perform governance, and they're both running out of ways to up their game. I once heard my economist teacher use the term survivalist mentality to describe the average Nigerian. It's a fairly accurate depiction of how we interact with money and status. How we constantly try to amass more of what we think we need. How this mentality makes us feel like we only amount to how much of something that we have. How we constantly try to gain more from what we feel will make our worth known, no matter how rich we are. What he failed to realize, though, is that our apparent survivalist mentality is a worldwide phenomenon, not just a Nigerian issue. Opening some random influencer's social media page will prove that in mere minutes. It's funny how most people that we call influencers are just people with a little more money than us, who sacrifice their financial well-being to buy the latest designer gadgets. They chase followers, they chase trends, they chase views, and they chase fame. They'll rent out items they don't own to pretend they're on the in of fashion. They'll rent out homes they can't afford to pretend that they live with glamour. And yet, they're still struggling. Most of them still work dead-end jobs to make ends meet. The average influencer doesn't get their breakfast at Tiffany's or buy themselves 4K red diamond rings. Yet why is it that we so often choose to do the things we do or buy the things we buy based on what these so-called influencers tell us to do? We form parasocial relationships with not only their character, but also their money. It doesn't help that a lot of these so-called influencers also have pretty terrible personalities. The only thing that's important to them is clout. How much something is worth to them is based on how many popularity points they can get by interacting with said item. And it seems that the more zeros that fall behind the price tag, the more desperate people are to own it. The genuinely wealthy don't escape this mentality either. And they've dug themselves a hole so deep, they've created an entire brands and cultures based off materialism inside. Luxury brands that don't preach actual practicality, but rather a lifestyle of being expensive, have popped up to fulfill the apparent needs to fulfill the big shot life. 
this is pretty, this is pretty harmful, and it's led to some pretty dreadful statistics. Like how over 68 pounds of clothing are thrown away every year in middle class households. Or how the average person only wears 10% of the clothes they buy. Or how Americans spend over $1.2 trillion on non-essential items per year. Society has emphasized buying for buying's sake. And it's already started to harm us. I remember when I first moved to Canada. We were suffering not only from severe culture shock, but also a major lack of funds. We were living below the poverty line, and we were moving from apartment to apartment to find the cheapest place to live. I attended school, but naturally, I didn't fit the bill of what the other kids considered normal. Poverty translated its way into my looks. I remember being constantly bullied for my tattered jeans, my off-brand shoes, clothes that I wore that had no eye aesthetic attraction, and my persistent illiteracy concerning products that I hardly even knew existed, mainly due to the fact that I couldn't afford them. I never knew any classy items, nor did I follow any hit trends, nor did I know the names of any f celebrities. All of these so-called important things barricaded my entry into this apparent it crowd. I remember getting my first phone and being overjoyed at just the thought of even having something that specifically belonged to me. My happiness was cut short, however, when I was told by the people around me that my phone was outdated, ugly, and not worth the trouble of using. It didn't help my case when every consequent phone I got was just a hand-me-down from whatever mid-grade my mom was currently using. Society integrated into me that I was only worth the amount of money that I had access to. And no matter how much any adult would try to preach to me that money wasn't everything, with the way people around me acted, I never got the message. A materialistic attitude doesn't start suddenly. It slowly spreads its message through childhood. Advertisements, sponsorships, scholar, and even entire children's shows have been created to f sell products. We have been trained from infancy to want things, to think we need things, to buy things. This is a mentality that we are carrying into adulthood. The cycle doesn't stop because society keeps on making us feel the system. I rem Capitalism has a long history, albeit not a very good one. Its origin stories involve 80-hour work weeks, heavy restrictions on trade unions, violent shutdowns, of, violent shutdowns of protests advocating for better working rights, and the good old substandard working pay. Thankfully, standards have improved now. And even though companies are still actively trying to fight against treating their workers with respect, a look at Canada's bloody Saturday proves they can do, and have done, much, much worse. Capitalism started off as just another economic problem solution, but it slowly morphed its way into a political ideology. It created separate branches called materialism and consumerism. Close brothers, capitalism is the father of them both, allowing them to thrive and prosper through the government itself promoting the act of consuming ever-increasing amounts of material garbage. Businesses promote the act of buying things so we can give them more wealth, and they live in an era where buying things is easy. We feed the conglomerates who break the rules to make more money. We feed the multinationals who attempt to sell basic human rights as a product. We give our money to people who are slowly killing our planet because they know they can get away with it. And the problem is, a lot of us have just become complacent. There was once a time in the West called the Roaring Twenties. Fashion and entertainment was exploding. The economy was booming. And life was classified as one giant party. It seemed like everything could all go up until it all came crashing down. The depression hit the world hard, and it left every salary man and blue-collar worker scrambling. The world relied too much on a singular system, and the government did too little to protect that system. Capitalism failed due to negligence, and it made our economy suffer due to it. Japan also has an ongoing culture of working 9 to 5 for a company that doesn't care about you, and overworking yourself not because you yourself care about that company, but because within that society, all you are worth to a company is how much productivity you can give to them. Capitalism is supposed to reward people who work hard, but all it does is create pa future paper pushers, employees, not employers. Capitalism at its core was designed to exploit the consumers. What is produced is what is profitable. What is unprofitable is what is neglected. What is neglected is what affects us the most. To the producer, so long as an item doesn't have a price tag, no matter how essential it is, it won't be produced. 
What is essential is invisible, literally. The West has never been approving of communism. Perhaps, rightfully so, as leaders of the communist revolution were far from saints, and the absolute state of disrepair that post-communist countries were left in wasn't pretty. However, their use of propaganda to fulfill their values was not free from questioning. The US is the prime offender, with fear taxes like the Red Scare and intervention taxes like the containment policy created to destroy the thought of any other form of economic rule other than capitalism within and out of America. The entirety of the Korean and Vietnam War were simply byproducts of the US attempting to be the be all and end all of who got to voice their opinion of communism. And because of that, it led those two countries into a state of messes. Decades later, and the US's propaganda worked, thanks to the corporate's, to the corporate's benefits. Mention the word socialism, and you'll still see people instinctively recoil. Try to argue where capitalism is truly up to snuff, and you'll still people see people use the age-old insult of stupid commie. Capitalism has been painted as the only system that can work, and it's only now that that mindset is slowly starting to change. Our generation has been put into a pretty tight spot. A worldwide pandemic has sent the economy into a state of utter mess. We have been bogged down with numerous mental health issues, and we will suffer the most from climate change, even though we contribute the least to it. We have our issues, but we're actively trying to solve them. We are the largest group that is adamant for social change. We've changed laws, upheld our rights, and made diversity and inclusion our number one goal. We've also been changing how the world views socialism for the better. Our generation has opened our eyes to what capitalism really means for us. And we've been trying to change it for the betterment of everyone. We are tired of the negative impacts of materialism. We are tired of the basic necessities that capitalism makes us pay for. We are tired of the corporate exploitation. We are tired of capitalism. The dirty game that corporate money makers play may not end within our generation, but we will strive for dignity. We will strive for change. Things come and go with time. Opinions shift and people change. Being able to let go of something that's broken in order to move forward is key for societal change. Either capitalism gets a major remodeling or you kick it to the curb. Whatever we do, it's time for current era capitalism to go. We can take out capitalism together.